performance practice from alpha to omega. So I don't know how much um, if we can get all the way to omega or not, but then we can start, we can attempt. <laughs> um, but you know, the idea really was that um, just some of you, I'm sure, have, have thought about these sorts of things. That is, how differently do we approach repertoire depending on the style? You know, the fact that you, you've got a whole list of packet of pieces from books all the way to genre, music, and everything in between. Um, and I just decided to give you some examples of pieces that have their own challenges vis-a-vis um, -vis style. Um, and and so we'll, we'll just go through them and talk about them. Um, now, uh, so what you should have is this packet that has the um, first piece being books good. And one of the Challenges with books to is ornamentation, I find. And this is this is a corral prelude, which this would be a great piece. It's on my uh, repertoire list, actually, that uh, packet you have of repertoire suggestions. Um, and you know, any corral prelude, of course, is fair game. I mean, you all want the pieces, but this is a particularly nice corral prelude. It's my favorite of all of books to It's not terribly difficult and um, it's a good link for a prelude, two, four or five minutes. Um, you have just the first page over here. But I just wanted to mention some aspects of ornamentation that are a bit of a challenge sometimes with books to And then just a little on articulation. Um, first of all, you see it begins with a scale. All right, so, um, you know, do you play it? Legato scale like that. Well, I think it's more interesting with this style to group the notes in a very subtle way, as I indicated for you there with the little slur and um, articulation marks. So. Measure, which is measure 11, you'll see that there's a trill on G. 
Well, the base is C. The G is a constant interval, and so therefore, that's, I, that, that's not a distant interval. I, I want to emphasize this, so therefore, I'm going to start the trill on the upper note in that case. So, um, listen from the beginning to maybe from there. So, um, that's going to come. You'll hear me, what I'm going to attempt to do 
is when I start the trills is that idea of starting the trill slowly and then speeding it up a little to make it less mechanical. We don't want a trill that's just da 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 or something like that. It's not, it's not um, so even trills really, and, and there's a lot of writing, a lot of people wrote from in, at the time, 17th, 18th century, to the primary sources that tell us that people didn't trill like that, 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 that there's, a, there's a freedom to trills. Um, and uh, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, I'll play a little and uh, we'll point out a couple of things that go along. Right at the beginning, let me just say this though. Um, first of all, I'm going to play on a four foot stop, two four foot stops on the positive division, an octave lower. So that, uh, because I like this with a, a light eight foot principal sound, with the tremolo on, but it has to be an octave lower to give eight foot sound. Now, right at the beginning, you have. Notice that I had to repeat that F sharp. That's what that little symbol means. You, you can barely see it, but it looks like it's a, um, a little, um, almost like a, 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 a sideways parentheses or something, but it's, it's just this little, like a little hook that is below, or it is between the F sharp and the G, the G that has a mordant above it. So what that means is that you repeat the F sharp. So it goes again like this, I'll play it slowly so you hear. That's a French ornament. This proves, you know, Bach knew. I mean, there are many examples. In my other class, I, I was talking about, um, in the Bach class, I talked about Omnish Verein from the Old Kutai. I talked about Schmuckidi from the Great 18 Cross. They both have examples of French ornamentation. So here's another one. He clearly knew French ornaments very well. Um, he had copied a lot of this music, you know. So, um, and, and you know, that's the way people got to know music in those days. They, they wrote it out. They got a copy of it, and then they made their own copy in their little notebook. So, all right, so here's a bit of this.
like, it looks like a tie, I guess might be a way to say that. It looks like a tie, the symbol for a tie. Well, it's, it's not a tie. It, it, it means that you are repeating the previous note. That's what it's talking about. That's what it, what it means. That's what that symbol means. It's called the French Port de Voix. And uh, it, it was a vocal ornament from the 17th century that made its way into, into keyboard music. And uh, so um, Bach, Bach used it. He, he really loved French music and, and, you know, he was very influenced by it. You may remember, um, you know, if, if you look at uh, the chronology I gave him in the Bach class, you know, he was, you know, he spent most of his life in central Germany, but when he was 15, he went up to northern Germany, lived in Nürnberg, Germany, and at that time, it was close to Celle, and that was a place where there was a court that had French musicians. So I think that this might have been his first exposure to live French music making. He, prior to that though, probably had seen some French music, had copied down some pieces of French composers, but uh, he really, he heard them at that time. And then, uh, you know, he later uh, was exposed to more French music uh, through copies. So, all right, uh, let's talk about uh, another work of Bach, and that's what's coming next. Um, I just wanted to maybe come a little bit a lot of time on this, but um, this is the, the great Fantasia and Fugue in G minor, and um, let's see what the sound uh, is that too loud for you. <laughs> Because I think that this requires a level of, of freedom in playing um, that uh, will help to make the music more interesting and more exciting. Um, you know, the whole opening section is very improvisatory. Um, and if you, you look at the page, you see this top voice, and then you see chords underneath. Um, I once heard someone play actually with that top voice on a solo stop, and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. The problem is that it, it, it doesn't work once you get to measure four, but um, it, it, at least it's, it's sort of interesting because I like the idea that that, that voice at the top is, um, it's almost as if it were a solo violin with chords underneath. Um, but um, one thing for the performance practice of this, to suggest is not only is it improvisatory, I think that, that that chord in the beginning sounds better, everything sounds better if you will release the chord a little early, almost um, as if it were a, a, an eighth note. So instead of when you're releasing on the F sharp, release sooner so that you can hear the B flat A G. So
this idea, and he imitates it at the octave, and that continues. This, in a way, is a little bit more strict because of the imitation. That's what he meant. It's supposed to be really weird. 
life, it's, it's such an incredibly passionate, uh, dramatic, tragic kind of piece. And then it's followed by this, this very different kind of view. And I often think of this piece as almost like the passion and then the resurrection, you know, combined. This fugue, even though it's in G minor, it's eventually going to end in G major. Um, and uh, but it's still it's much more lighthearted. It's 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 a, a, a playful kind of fugue. Um, and this melody, or this rather this subject, is based on the melody of a, of a Dutch folk song. Either the choir to the organ. 
So if you start with the choir or with the singing with Gloria and Chelsea Steo, the next phrase is organ. That's in Terra Fox. Next phrase is choir. Next phrase is organ. So we go back and forth like that. And that's called alternation practice, or the Latin is in alternatum. And so that's why it says fifth couplet. What that means is that this is the fifth part of the um, of the uh, glory. And at the bottom of the page, you see Domine Deus, Lord God, Anus Dei, Lamb of God. Lord God, Lamb of God, you know, who takes away the sins of the world. Um, that's what this particular couplet is. And when you hear it, it makes sense. It's, it, it, it fits the mood of that text. It's not glory to God and I, it's the Lord God, Lamb of God, so it's more reflective. And it's a very quiet, reflective kind of piece. And in those days, I mean, you know, that's why Mass would take so long, <laughs> because, I mean, they, they would do all this stuff. And, you know, the orchestra would, would play this long piece. And, um, but it was also in, in the days when there was much more separation between the people and what was going on around the altar. Um, so, uh, now, um, one of the, really, the most important issue with um, this music of Couperin, this is part of what some people would call it the French Baroque, because, of course, he's a Baroque composer, he's a contemporary of, of Jay Spock. Um, but it is also what some people call the classical French school. And just don't be confused. Don't think that if it's classical French, then why is it in the French world? That's just what we refer to because it's sort of like the golden age. That's what that means. Because um, there's a great book by Fenner Douglas uh, on the classical French organ, and it's talking about the organ of the 17th and 18th centuries. And the French had a way of building organs and writing music for the organ that. Um, really was established in the early part of the 17th century, especially by the 1640s and 1650s, that lasted all the way until the Revolution. The Revolution began in 1789, so, um, you know, everything fell apart at that point. But uh, up until then, they were, they were doing all these things, and so and, and things were rebuilt and revived in, in the 19th century, but it took them a while. So, one of the important things, though, about this style is that you don't play it as they, and even they write about it, like most of the writers, they, they, they will say, you know, we don't play our music as it is written, you know, and what they may do is they tend to lengthen dots. If you see a dot, like right at the beginning, this, um, Double dotting. I'm making those dots longer. I'm not playing. Which is how it's written. Now I'm making the long notes longer, the short notes a little shorter. And that's just the way they, they play it. Um, so I'm going to play a bit of this, and you'll see just by hearing me play it that you know, that's sort of the style. Um, but notice that when there are leaps, like in uh, measure 12, it's the last measure in the second system, you see all those leaps, and I'm going to be a little bit more strict in time. I'm not going to play. No, that's not right, because they specifically say when you have big leaps, you don't, you don't do this. So here we go, we're in two.
plus sign and then the, the symbol for a mordant. That plus means that you play the French pour de voix, which is like what, what you found in Bach. But Bach's way, another way of marking that is to have a little symbol that looks like the tie. In this case, the plus sign means the same thing. So it means, it means that you play E and then you repeat E before the F sharp. So you have an A major chord. So, so that's what it means. We, we know what these things mean because French composers were very good about, um, this is with their harpsichord music and the ornaments are, are the same. At the beginning, in, with the table of contents, all that, at the beginning of their books of harpsichord music, they would always have, have a um, uh, ornament table. And they would tell you how, and they would say, this is how I ornament, because they weren't always doing exactly the same things. So that's why they would say, this is how I chill, this is how I do the mornings. The French word for mornings, by the way, is passé, which means to pinch. So, so there's, there's always that sense that you know, there's a little bit of pinch in it. You just have to make sure that when you're playing a piece like this, that you aren't pinching too hard. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's just a light pinch. It's, it's a little bit more expressive. Okay. All right, let's move on. Let's move to the 19th century. Okay. Uh, I said uh, in the master class the other day that I uh, mentioned Mendelssohn in here. Okay. One of the greatest challenges with the Mendelssohn organ works is the slurs, the fact that uh, they don't seem to make sense. And I think that uh, in some cases, you know, you should just do what you think is musical, and if the, if the slurs don't make any sense, then don't do them that way. <laughs> you, know, we, you know, we all have good musical sense, and we can, we can think about things, and um, I just think you have to be very careful about how you're approaching things. Don't be too literal. It's sort of like saying, well, I know that I'm supposed to register this piece this way. Maybe this piece is supposed to be a or two measures. It must be that way. Well, that may sound horrible on the organ that you go and play, wherever it may be, or you know. And you just need to use your ears and say, well, you know, maybe I should use the mixture. It really does sound bad, doesn't it? You know. And um, I mean, I can think of an organ in particular where you know the mixtures are so loud that it's just it's it's ridiculous. I and I know with this particular organ, I have to register everything at least one or two dynamic levels under what I would normally do just because it's so loud. And, you know, I mean, we don't have to play it loud all the time. I mean, um, all right, so here is, this, this is the out of movement. This is the third movement from Mendelssohn's fourth sonata, this is the sonata in B-flat major. So this movement is F. Um, and the challenge here is this, is, is look at these slurs. We've got the, uh, if we do it the way he has, I guess that's enough sound. Okay. Um, all right. You see, just let's look at the right hand. This melodic line. That little break. Okay. You have to decide what does that mean. Is that? Some people suggest that with Middleton, that's simply suggesting. Uh, a, a very subtle articulation. That's it. Because but I've heard people overdo it. You don't want to do this. That's just ridiculous. Why in the world would you do that? You know, I'm not saying you would do that. None of you would ever do that. But I've heard people do it. And I think, what are they thinking? And then I realize, no, they're not thinking. They're just going on autopilot, and maybe they've been told to do that. But really, what what makes musical sense? Maybe you could get away with doing, you know. Natural to have a breath, and yet he's got the slur going. 
So I think there you simply have to decide what makes sense. From this point on, it's actually fine. It kind of makes sense, uh, pretty much. Um, now, you may notice, too, that Mendelssohn, go back to the beginning of it, notice that he has clap one, clavier one, and that's it. Well, if you've looked at various editions of this, particularly older editions of Schirmer, for example, there will be an indication to play the top voice in another manual. Um, I personally don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, it sort of makes sense to play that melodic line on a different manual. Um, if we want to be curious about it, well, you know, we stay all on one manual. And then later, I think I gave you the whole piece. I'm not going to show up. He, yes, on the second page, you see we have an indication for Clavier 2, which is where we could have perhaps a solo stop, perhaps a string, or a very light lead, or something like that. You know. So, uh, all right, let's let's move on. That's that's enough said about the slurs. The stuff. Next thing to talk about. Um, am I correct that we go to 515? Is that right? Yeah. I got off schedule coming out today. Um, now, uh, from I want to talk about Franck. Um, the thing about Franck is uh, the French themselves debate about how to play Franck. Um, but I am of the mindset that we should play Franck very freely. But at the same time, um, the freedom has to make sense. You know, you might say that yes, we can play freely, but we have to have we have to have something from which to be free. <laughs> I mean, does that make sense? You know, I mean, you have to have some sort of sense of rhythm. You can't just be all over the place. So, um, it essentially means play expressively. Um, all the accounts of Franck's playing, unfortunately, we have no recordings, but all the accounts of Franck's playing are that he did play extremely freely. So, um, that is something to think about. Um, now, if you look at this, is a very famous piece, the E major chorale, chorale number one, composed in 1890, uh, the year of his death. Uh, so these are the last, the three chorales, his last works for organ, uh, his last works in general. Um, I think that if you just look at the beginning, this is such a wonderful, wonderful melodic line. Um, and if we play it exactly, sort of, let's get some sound here. And I'm going to have the, the read in, you know, I think whenever when you're registering Franck and he calls for foundations, the Ogwa was meant to be part of the foundations or the fundor. But be careful, you don't want the oboe to take over because he was accustomed to an oboe that was actually very soft, especially when the box was closed all the way. The organ sensibility was like that. So um, this might be a little on the loud side, but at any rate, it's good to have the timbre of the reed. Um, but if you're playing it absolutely in time, D, 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 it sounds ridiculous. I mean, you know,
tart too much because it's a long piece. Uh, I like to say you don't want to take too many picnics along the way. I mean, you, you've got, you've got 15 minutes to go, people, you know, so, so don't overdo it. But you've got to have some uh, give and take with it. Then he takes the theme and he just modulates it. He puts it in G major, third relationship, E major to G, third relationship.
Now, um, this piece, um, I, uh, I love this piece, and I, I studied with the composer's sister, uh, the organist Marie Clarinat, and um, I think it's important, I just wanted to mention some things as we finish up here, some things that, that maybe you don't know about the piece. Um, if you're interested, I'm not going to mention every little detail, but I wrote an article about this piece this in the American Organist a few years ago. You can, you can find it easily online. Um, but there are certain things that you want to remember. Um, one, um, this piece, uh, it came out of improvisation, like a lot of music from this period in the organ world. Um, my teacher used to say that, well, I mean, my brother John was writing the train from Saint-Germain-Lay, which is a western suburb of Paris, into Paris to go to school and so forth. Um, he, he was thinking about this piece, and she said, you can, you can hear the train, the effect of the train, for example, um, in things like uh, this, the... Um, all of that stuff, and sort of this, that, you know, the, the old type of train, you know, from this would have been in the 1930s. Uh, this piece um, is from 1937. Uh, and of course, he died in 1940, right, uh, the beginning of World War II. Um, the other thing that's important is um, that uh, you see the little um, paragraph there, written by Jean, um, the, uh, the French is saying, when the Christian soul can no longer find new words in its um, Cry! It's uh, imploring for the mis the um, the mercy of God. It repeats incessantly the same invocation with a vehement faith. Reason uh, has reached its limit. Uh, faith alone follows its ascension. Uh, so um, and we know, of course, that the litany in this case is this theme that recurs. Um, this, the, it, which is, of course, in the top voice. Now, um, notice that uh, there's an indication. This particular edition, by the way, um, it, you know, is an edition that was edited by Karim Karana. Um, and there are things like when it says, you see, anything in parentheses is editorial. That's her suggestion, like right? when it says, yeah, articulate it. You know, articulate it very well. That's her suggestion. Um, he would have played in a very legato way, particularly for the, the left hand pedal. Sometimes you hear people play this like this. They will go um, like... Right. 
you know, the Crest Observatory. Um, so, uh, uh, another thing that's interesting, you know, a little tidbit about this piece, um, I didn't know this until I was doing some research on the piece, that apparently in the 1970s there was an English rock band, I think they called, um, Renaissance, their name is Renaissance, and somehow they knew this piece because they have a song called Running Hard. And if you can look it up, and in my article I give you the, the exact link for it, but I think if you just Googled, you'd find it. But the song is called Running Hard, and that whole, that theme, this is, is at the beginning of the song, it's changed a little bit, but the song goes on for about 10 minutes, and it's twice as long as the organ piece. But that is all, that, that whole thing is just sort of a prelude, it's an instrumental kind of introduction to the, the singing of the song, which is different, has a melody that's, that's similar, but, but it's different from this. But I thought, isn't that interesting? In that, because it's obvious, they didn't just make that up. I mean, that, that somebody knew this piece of drama. So see the organ, it's a bunch of rock music, I mean. There you go, you found it already, yeah. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, it's, it's an interesting uh, way that the organ finds its, its way into popular culture.